Well, good morning, Mount Pisgah. Amen. I'm so excited to be here to open God's word with you. Uh, can we just put our hands together for that worship team? Didn't they bless our hearts? Amen. I don't know about you, but I need a fresh wind. Um, let me rush to express my gratitude and thanks to each of you, our church family, for all the text messages and calls and emails as Amber and I welcomed our very first child on October 25th. Uh, she is here. Her name is Karis Lillian Brown. She is, was, she eating, y'all. Okay, grocery, grocery bill is off the chain. Amen. Uh, this girl is eating. She was seven pounds, three ounces, 20 inches long, and Amber and the baby are doing great. So thank you so much uh, for all the well wishes, and now the fun begins. So we are super excited. Uh, this was a seven-year miracle. We wrestled, battled, through everything at the kitchen, but the kitchen sink at infertility for seven years. And last year, uh, my wife had an emergency surgery for an ectopic pregnancy. And this year, can you say, but God. <laughs> but God <laughs> made a way. Uh, you know, my preaching, I've always tried to leave room for theology that says God doesn't owe us anything. Am I making sense? Like, some people say that, oh, it's always going to work out the way that you hope, but that's not necessarily the case. He didn't owe us a child, but he did. So I'm so thankful for his grace uh, that he looked upon us, and uh, we are excited nonetheless. All right, uh, for our last message in the go portion of this series, uh, please focus your attention with me at Acts chapter 18, verses 9 through 11. Acts chapter 18, verses 9 through 11 and it's the NIV version I'll be reading. This is how my Bible reads. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you. And no one is going to attack you and harm you. Because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half. Teaching them the word of God. Uh, for just a few moments in your hearing, I want to speak to our hearts from the subject, go with the gospel, stay the course. Go with the gospel, stay the course. Before I do, let's pray. Father in heaven, the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word shall indeed stand. God, it is my sincere prayer that your word will stand mightily in me that your word will stand mightily in this place, mightily in each of us and in our community, in our city and in our state and in this world. God, I pray now that as always that you would lift every burden, loose every chain, bind every evil spirit and destroy every yoke. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Would you get glory in this place? And the people of God said together, amen. In times like these, we need an anchor. In times like these, we need a savior. Be very sure, be very sure, your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. The year was 2004, and the unimaginable, the unthinkable happened in a weather phenomena in Florida where four hurricanes hit the state over a mere six-week span. Charlie, Francis, Ivan, and Jean would test the resources of the state and the resolve of its people. And I was learning how to fly in Florida that summer. And I remember my flight instructor and I feeling like the hurricane Ivan had gone out into the Gulf Coast. And we literally thought the coast was clear. Well, thinking it was okay, against our better judgment, we decided to go flight training that day. And everything seemed fine for a moment until all of a sudden, one of the outer bands of Ivan had completely encapsulated the airplane. Now, with palpitating heart and bated breath, we radioed air traffic control to let them know that we were in trouble. And what happened next surprised me. The air traffic controller came on, of our, on, on our headsets and 
He called our call sign and he simply said these words, stay on your course. The airplane was bouncing around like a roller coaster and we were afraid and we couldn't see a thing and we heard him giving instructions to Delta, Southwest United, and American. And then after what seemed like an eternity, he came to us, he spoke to us again, he called our call sign and he said the same words, stay on your course. We were sweating, we were nervous, and we knew that we had done the right thing by admitting that we needed help. Then lastly, after things calmed down and he wasn't so busy, he called us again. He said, I'm sorry, I know it probably seemed like an eternity for you guys, but I told you to stay the course because I have a radar and I could see what you couldn't. And what's behind you, what's in front of you, is, is better than what's behind you. So I told you to stay on your course. You see, in our text, Paul is in the city of Corinth, which was a Roman colony and considered the most influential province, both politically and economically. However, it was a place of unparalleled disillusion, and they desperately needed the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I want to ask you this morning, how does this parallel with what we see in our community, both spiritually and socially? Because the, the common mindset is that those who really need the gospel, those who desperately need to be saved, are the uneducated and the poor. Ricky, why do you say such a comment like that? Because if I were to describe a place of immense decadence and debauchery, John's Creek isn't the first place that will probably come to your mind. But the context of Corinth reminds you and I that you can be in power economically and politically and still be in great depravity. You see, in Acts 18, our writer Luke gives us a behind-the-scenes footage, if you will, that delves into Paul's critical second missionary journey. In Philippi, He's beaten and imprisoned. In Thessalonica, Paul's ministry causes social unrest. In Athens, some accept the gospel, some reject it, and some are just plain old indifferent. So Paul's normal MO would be to just go to the next town. Oh, but not this time. Because God spoke to Paul in a vision. He says to him these words, do not be afraid. Keep on speaking and don't be silent, for I am with you. No one is going to attack you and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth teaching them the word of God for a year and a half. Now keep in mind, Paul has endured severe treatment and yet remains faithful. Because God sends him a comforting word of his divine protection. Now understand that Paul's rejection by the Jews is what justified his ministry to the Gentiles. And can I just say to you parenthetically that when God sends you something that you need and you reject it, he'll send it to somebody else as a blessing. How many times have you seen a young lady get married and here comes some little dusty fella from her past saying, I always knew that the Lord wanted me to marry you. Well, it's too late now. She's married. When you reject what God sends you that you need, he'll send it to somebody else as a blessing. Now, you may already know if you're here on a Sunday morning, put on clothes and came down to the church, that the Bible says the words, do not be afraid, 365 times. That's one for every single day. So I want to acknowledge that fear has taken up just as much space in the lives of those who are Christ followers. But I want to give you an antidote today for fear. Most of the time, for those who are blood-bought believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, fear is false evidence appearing real. That's what it is. Fear is false 
evidence appearing real. Most of the time, we are fearful about something that never even happens. If you're honest with yourself, if you think back six months or a year to what you were most fearful about, you can't even remember exactly what it was. See, the reason why these words that he speaks to him are so important is because Paul knew what it was like to be harmed. He knew what it was like to be beaten. He knew what it was like to be in prison. And if the enemy can keep us thinking about our past, he'll rob us of our future. If the enemy can keep us paralyzed in fear about very real things that actually took place, then he can rob us of what God wants to do in our present. The reason why this word to Paul is so significant, no one will harm you and attack you because he knows what it's like to be harmed and he knows what it's like to be attacked. So as we try to apply this text to our lives today, I want you to know that I wrestled with this for the past week and a half, two weeks. I wrestled with it, and I was talking to Pastor Steve, and he encouraged me. He says, hey, man, listen, we're not just pastors. We're also priests and prophets. So I want you to know that today we got some sermonic Brussels sprouts coming your way. <laughs> you laughing now. What do I mean by that? These are the things that we don't necessarily reach for right away. And I'm not talking about the, the good Brussels sprouts with all of the honey and butter drizzled all over them and they're toasted to perfection. I'm talking about like boiled Brussels sprouts. Nobody eats those. Here it is. First, Paul doesn't allow his skill to get in the way of going with the gospel. Let me explain. Paul was a tent maker. He was a leather worker. And what we see in this discourse is that Paul has just received an offering that enabled him to go from bivocational ministry to full-time ministry. So we understand that ministry then had a financial implication, still does today. So at this point, Paul could have said, you can keep your offering. I would rather have the safety net of being bivocational, having income coming from another place, than, rather than having all of my income coming from ministry. He could have said, you can keep that offering because I have valuable skills that make me money. So in our culture, when someone has valuable skills that are good enough to provide for them, we would call that person a professional, by definition. I'm glad that Paul didn't say that all this being shipwrecked and fastings, voluntarily and involuntarily being beaten and thrown into prison, all of that's for the birds. I'm glad that Paul didn't say that. You see, in our culture, this is the exact opposite of who we are. This is very countercultural. Because you and I don't, didn't go to school and gain valuable skills to go toward trouble. You went to school and gained valuable skills to go away from it. Oh, don't look at me with that tone of voice. Look at me straight ahead. Won't nobody know but me and you. See, it's, uh, an attorney does not go to law school to get a degree or, or an educator. You, don't, you didn't go to school to get a PhD or to become a nurse practitioner to go toward trouble. You did those things to go away from it. And I'm telling you, this hit me squarely in the forehead as I was studying this passage of Scripture. Here's why. Because over the 20-year span of my ministry, I faced a really hard time at one point. I dealt with the loss of close relationships. I dealt with Betrayal. I'm talking about people who put their feet under my dinner table and were secretly doing everything to un they could to undermine what God was trying to build. And you know what I allowed to creep in my heart? I got a commercial pilot license in my pocket. I don't have to put up with this. See, people who are skillful, people who are professional, they don't often want to see themselves getting in trouble. Even, watch this, if it's for the gospel's sake. I was guilty of that. I said that in my own heart at one point when I was really down. You see, when you think about the burdensome toll of going with the gospel, be honest with yourself this morning. Do you feel 
that's for somebody else. Next thing we see is that Paul didn't let his status get in the way of going with the gospel. Paul can be quoted saying, I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. He sort of kind of touting his resume in a way. He was educated in some of the finest uh, arenas uh, theologically and biblically. Uh, He says, essentially, I'm the creme de la creme. And what does he do after the Jews reject him? He uses that to justify going to preach to the Gentiles. Watch this. After the Jews reject him. He used that to justify going to preach to the Gentiles. Mount Pisgah, church family, can I share with you a hard truth this morning? I've been in ministry 20 years. In the latter 10, I've spent in multi-ethnic and predominantly white spaces. Can I share with you a hard truth this morning? This is the mark evangelistically of the white suburban megachurch in America. What do I mean? We tend to focus on the there and everywhere, all the while ignoring the right here. But Paul uses the rejection of the Jews first to justify his ministry to the Gentiles. Why is this important? Because in the suburbs, we go to Christian churches and we send our kids to Christian schools, many of us. And this then is a Christian community. But the problem we don't realize is that the police officers answer calls to domestic violence in gated communities in Johns Creek, just like they do on the southwest side of Atlanta. That the paramedics come to overdose calls and putting Narcan in people's systems in this neighborhood, just like on the southwest side of Atlanta. You see, God is telling us today the same words that he spoke to Paul. He says, I have many people in this city. And a better rendering of that text simply says this, I am going to save a lot of people right where you are. That's what that means. And I believe in my heart that though we may be in an affluent area and though people may uh, have fishes on the back of their cars here, God is going to save many people in this city. Can you say amen? Finally, Paul didn't let his tenure of salvation get in the way of the gospel. What do we mean by that? Everyone would agree that Paul is like the picture of a mature, committed Christian. I mean, if you ever want to feel far from God, read about Paul. That's how I feel. I mean, Paul preaches the gospel. He gets beaten. He gets in prison. And then when he gets out of prison, what does he do? He goes right back to doing what got him beaten and thrown in prison. I mean, Paul has this amazing, ebullient drive to share the gospel with whoever will listen and with people who won't listen. Can I be honest with you? Some of us have just been saved too long. We've forgotten what it was like to be bound by sin. Even though Paul is a mature and committed Christian, he doesn't become less passionate about reaching the lost. He becomes more passionate about reaching the lost. Do you know that the Bible says that the God of this age has blinded their eyes so that they cannot see? So all the while, some of us are looking at the world and we're saying, man, why can't they get it together? And why are they trying to force us to do certain things? The God of this age has placed a blindfold over their eye and they cannot see. What's the solution? Well, we are the light of the world. Bill Bray was a Cornish miner who accepted Jesus Christ is a savior at 1823, the young age of 29. He lived a life of drunkenness and debauchery before his salvation, but he became such an outgoing witness and testimony for God that he became known as God's glad man. Bill Bray reminded himself that the burden that he had serving Christ was lighter than the one he had serving the devil. The yoke that he wore in partnership with and submission to Jesus was easier than the yoke that he wore as one of the devil's disciples. 
You see, there's just something on the inside of us that must be reminded of the joy of our salvation. What do I mean by that? For me, it's some song lyrics that simply say, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply staying within, seeking to rise no more. Here's my favorite part. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the waters, lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me. You see, people who remember the depths of their deliverance go with the gospel unprovoked. You see, in the old church, they would say, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul shouts hallelujah, thank God for saving me. If Charles Elliott were here this morning, he would say, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou biddest me to come to thee. You see, here's the resolution to this whole thing. The Lord spoke to Paul. And it is my prayer this morning that God would speak to each of you right now. What I believe David is saying when he says, Lord, cast me not from your presence. I don't believe he's saying, Lord, don't take your warm and fuzzies from me or, or Lord, don't take your goosebumps. I believe he's saying, Lord, don't take your voice. You see, I want to acknowledge that this has been a trying season, to say the least. But I want to close this morning with these simple questions. Where are you afraid? Where have you allowed fear to put a cast around your faith? And I want to acknowledge the fact that many of you may be like Paul. You have very real circumstances that actually happen. Real bruises in ministry. Real wounds that the enemy would try to bring up and cause you to rehearse. Where are you afraid this morning? Where have you stopped speaking? Or oh, in other words, where should you remain? Where have you quietly resigned? And where, are you, where have you begun to draw back what God is saying? No, I want you to press forward. And where are you silent? Where have you quit? Where have you decided my voice isn't going to be heard here? Where have you decided these people don't want to hear what I have to say? Remember, Paul used the rejection of the Jews to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. You see, somebody here today or online is in a situation. And here's the situation. It's simple. You've said, if God doesn't tell me to stay, then I'm going to quit. This is your word to go with the gospel. You see, when God gives us a task to do something, he also gives us the power to do it. In the presence of God, Paul found his courage and his strength to stay the course. I want to invite you into a time of prayer. And as you close your eyes and bow your heads, I want to challenge you even this week as you go about your normal week to ponder these questions, to ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart. Where are you afraid? Where are you withdrawing? And where have you begun to become silent? Father, in the name of Jesus. God, I pray for my brother and my sister here. These are your precious sons and daughters. God, I realize that many of them have very real fears, very real injuries, very real wounds from their past. But Father God, I pray right now that you would send them a word the way that you did, Paul. That God, we would go with the gospel and we would stay the course because what is ahead of us is better than what's behind us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.